Hey everybody, Tyree here with Before I Forget, along with Kevin. Say hey, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. And he's going to go ahead and introduce <laughs> our guest today, because we have guests, as usual, has been the, the trend for our shows lately. Go ahead and hit it, Kevin. It has been the trend for our shows lately, which is really, really awesome. Um, typically, like there for a while, like Tyree and I were struggling to have guests uh, sometimes, and so it would just be he and I, and I know people get tired of listening to he and I, so... Um, without further ado, we have today Jennifer on, right? She is um entrepreneur, business owner, wife, uh, veteran, uh, currently in the IRR. So uh and she's got a pretty cool story and we're gonna hear talk about it. So Jennifer, say hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for uh making the time. Um, you know, it's especially on a Sunday evening. Oh yeah, um, no one likes to work on a Sunday, right? Yeah, that's uh, pretty normal. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Well, I guess in the yeah. the the, uh, the, uh, the business world, right? the small business world, running your own show kind of business, um, which is kind yeah. of what you do, right? Yeah, <laughs> I try at least. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, well, we'll get into that. So, Tyree, ask your question that you like to ask people. As usual, we have one of our favorite questions that we uh, ask every guest, and the. Uh... This time, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. Why did you join the military? Um, So <laughs> I actually joined after college. So, um, and I had that kind of plan because I, I didn't know what the military did until I was pretty much a junior in college, really. And um, I, I mean, I, I was being someone that was in the army at the time and I kind of like started getting familiar with what they do and I realized okay it's like all sorts of people that join the army right and then I learned about um you know like the benefits and um you know that it's not just infantry how people like normal civilians must think that it's like every job out there exists pretty much in the military as well um so Kind of broke my own bias of what I thought it was, and uh, I started actually like kind of appreciating it um, as I learned more and more about it. And um, basically, I got really interested in wanting to do something kind of like bigger in a way. Um, you know, the whole spiel about wanting to do something for your country and um, being you know, part of something big and becoming just breaking out of my shell too. Um, and it was interesting because I um, actually was working, I accepted a job offer at Raytheon Missile Systems and I got assigned to the Javelin Missile System wow. as a quality engineer. And so that's a big uh, army weapon system. So I was really excited about that. And um you know, I had been like telling myself I want to join the Army Reserves because I knew that was an option. And that way I didn't have to give up my career path as well because I worked really hard to get my engineering degree. So, um, yeah, the more I was, I was at Raytheon pretty much for a year um, before I finally went and talked to the recruiter and told him, OK, yeah, I'm going to sign up uh, for the Army Reserves. I already had told my boss at work that I was going to join and he was, um, you know, prepared for, for that whole thing, me being gone for like three and a half months. Um, and so, yeah, I finally kind of, I guess that's kind of been my, the trend with me is like, you know, I'm always like trying to prepare for something and then it's not until I just say, you know what, I'm just going to do it because if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. And, uh, it was um, it kind of, that's kind of how that went and then how everything else in my life since then has, has gone because, you know, I try to plan out things and then I'm just like, this is taking too long. I just need to do it um, to get moving on it. And um, it was cool because I kind of went in with like, uh, you know, kind of proud to be able to then call myself a service member after joining then going back to work and working on something that's, you know, a big part of the military. And um, it's cool. It was cool working there because I got to meet a lot of the people that, you know, had come back from overseas and told us about how they use the weapon system 
overseas and how it saved their life. And um, even some really funny stories, even, you know, like back when uh, the initial push to Iraq happened, we actually had someone tell us that, oh, uh, back when, you know, they didn't have to get, um, what do you call it? Uh, I guess, I don't know, I forgot what it's called, the uh, engagement or whatever. So they didn't have to get approval to like use oh, the like, rules missiles of engagement? before. Yeah. <laughs> um, back when it wasn't as difficult to get approval. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Back when you didn't yeah. have to like call up to hire to get like, you know, PID and then like, you know, follow the rules of engagement. Yep. Yeah. That's when Tyree, you know, Tyree and I were there back in 04, the the, the second wave of OIF2. And yeah, the mm -hmm. ROE was 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 loosely considered <laughs> during mm -hmm. engagements. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny you, you say that because like um, and you talk about like the 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 majority of the civilian population looks at the United States Army or the military in general as infantry. And that's what he and I were. And um, when we first started doing this, we talked to a lot of guys that we were uh, served with. And um, we always ask the question, why did you join the infantry? And it's, it's that it's almost exactly that same answer. It's like nobody, nobody, you know, grew up playing finance. Nobody grew up playing mm -hmm. Dentac. You know what I mean? Like nobody grew up playing. I know you were, you were Seaburn, right? You were chemical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's not kids in a playground running around being like, I'm the Seaburn expert. You know what I mean? Gas, <laughs> gas, gas. You know what I mean? So, yep. um, all necessary jobs, but like uh, everybody plays infantry when they're kids. So I thought it was, I, mm -hmm. I thought it was kind of funny that you said that. Why um, did you go uh, Seaburn? Mm -hmm. so that's interesting. Uh, I did that for a minute. It was uh, it's a little bit of fun. It burns, but uh, watch it off. Yeah. Um, so I actually initially um was supposed to be an Intel analyst. Um, but I my mom was not at the time yet a US citizen. She was just a resident. So um I only had a secret clearance with uh because of Raytheon. And so they told me I couldn't get a top secret clearance through the army um, initial processing in order to be able to go to the Intel analyst job um, because of my mom not being a US citizen yet. So um, they told me to take another MOS and that was actually when I was at, um, at MEPS processing. So I had a last minute pick a job that had an opening near me well, and I had already, you know, packed up my entire life in storage and I was already there. And that's when they told me, broke the news, like, oh, you can't, you can't be an Intel analyst. So you have to pick another MOS. So I didn't have much of a choice, actually. It was Seaburn or um, MP. Ugh. And the funny thing was um, I ended up being a Seaburn MOS for an MP unit. And I pretty much how to qualify on everything that they they do in order to be in the unit too because I was the only Seaburn person in the unit for a while um oh, but that, guy. that sucks yeah so that was it was kind of a last minute thing but it's funny because my bachelor's is actually in chemical engineering so I kind of was like oh maybe it'll be kind of like my bachelor's degree which it's not at all no two different things um well, yeah. you know, and I, it sounds like either way, you like the army was, you were meant to go to Fort Leonard Wood. Like either way yeah. you spent it, you were going there. Um, uh, don't let me asking, where's your mom from? Mexico. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, would not have guessed that. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, do you speak Spanish? Yep. Damn, I want to speak Spanish. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so. Easy. Is it is it Tyree? Is it easy? Sure. I've heard you speak English, man. You suck. I'm just kidding. You're good. You're good, you're good at English. I, I take that back. I apologize. I gave it a shot. Thank you. Yeah. You <laughs> yeah. Now I was gonna ask you something else. Um. Oh, when did you? Uh. So when when did you go to Fort Leonard Wood? Um. It was 2016. I want to say. That's crazy. I was a drill sergeant there in 2017. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. In the MP uh, world, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, one question, one question that we typically ask too is, um, and and we talked about it in the in the pre-show, but so you were elementary school during nine eleven. Mm -hmm. Now at that young age, like you clearly don't really understand like the impact of it, right? Or like what's going on? You just know like, hey, something happened in America. 
<laughs> how is it? How do you like so? Because when 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 nine eleven happened, Tyree and I were both in base to training. We weren't there together, but we were at Fort oh, Benning wow. uh, at the same time, right? Wow. Um, I, I graduated my training three days later. So like I had already wow. gone to the eleven Bravo OSIT. I you know nine eleven happened. I turned nineteen on the ninth. I turned uh, or nine eleven happened on the eleventh, and then I graduated on the fourteenth. And then and Tyree I think was in like uh, red or white phase. That was day one, week one for me when that went down. And, wow. Uh, yeah. You know, I was there until December. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we can look at it as like, and I remember when 9-11 happened, it was, it was a matter of like, oh my God, the Twin Towers were hit by terrorists. And I'm like, what the fuck are the Twin Towers? I've never, I don't know what these are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, because from, from small town Arkansas, we don't concern ourselves with anything outside of uh, our, you know, four, uh, four borders. But um, uh, much like California. Uh, we care for everything. <laughs> everything that's close to California. We care for it, right? Like, <laughs> well, we don't yeah. really care much for Florida. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's. I think that's the entire U.S. Texas. But when you know, for, so for us, you know, we we were we were witnessing nine eleven obviously from afar, and we we knew that we were going to be a part of it. Um you know, in the military and we were eventually going to, going to uh, deploy to Afghanistan or Iraq. When 9-11 happened, you were in elementary school. So for you mm -hmm. to be able to grow up and then get to the point where you can join the military and be involved in the military during that same, that same uh, campaign, that's crazy, right? Does that not, is that not like, do you, have, you, have you ever like put some like thought into that? Like you were able to live your entire youth mm -hmm. and then be like now i'm a part of it yeah i mean um it's funny that you kind of put it that way because i you know like i had said i didn't know a lot about the military at all um up until college really and um i actually started kind of getting into you know watching all those movies and all that stuff um and you know, watching that and like seeing, you know, the big impact, like units that had movies made about them um, overseas had, um, I was like, you know, obviously I'm not going to be doing that tough of a job, but, um, you know, seeing everyone work as a team to get a, the mission done that essentially is like, you know, to making sure that the U.S. is safe and whatnot and just seeing the big impact that it you know, that we need to have on the world to protect our freedoms because, you know, this is the one country where you can pretty much get away with the most um, and be protected still. So, and a lot of people don't like, you know, it's taken, that's taken to advantage for sure. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, I wanted to be a part of that bigger mission in a way. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I haven't really thought back like to 9-11, but it's crazy that that many years went by and we were still in Afghanistan after all that happened, you know? Um, I, mean, I, I mean, there was, uh, I remember too, that when I had joined um, my MP unit, there was rumors about um, going to Iraq at the time because they were on the rotation list. Um, to go and I was kind of excited about that because I was you know it's I was kind of like okay I'm joining and I actually wanted to go somewhere and do something even um, if it did have like a small impact um, but I never got the opportunity to be part of a unit that would actually went on a um, rotation actually the MP unit that I was in for most of my reserve time ended up not going to Iraq. They ended up going to Guantanamo Bay, which they only take MPs there. <laughs> so I wouldn't have gone anyways. And I had gotten promoted and transferred out of the unit um, because of the promotion. And I joined a Seaburn unit um, and they were, they're actually, uh, the Seaburn unit that I was with um, was home base because they do any, you know, any, if a disaster or, anything would happen here on home base, Seaburn would be the ones, you know, calling the shots and stuff. So I kind of got integrated into that bigger mission and being prepared if anything were to happen um, and training and, and whatnot. And it was interesting going through COVID um, 
being in a seaborne unit that's supposed to be home based and sort of be prepared for that sort of a a thing. But um, and there were some people that got to be a little bit more involved with going and being part of other units to train them up to handle the shortages that there were and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, I went my whole reserves career pretty much not uh, being a big part of it. But I mean, the other side of it is I can say I had more of an impact um, in my civilian career to the military than my actual military background. Well, you'd be surprised how often that happens. There's a lot of people who go their entire careers from the reserves who never deploy ever at any point. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they dug it. Sometimes it's just the way the cookie crumbles and they just don't go. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I wouldn't feel bad about it. Yeah, no, and that's not to take away from anyone's service because, you know, and there's, I, I you know, we, we, we've all, I'm sure, met a lot of folks who have joined the military and never deployed, never did, you know, the job overseas. Um, and they feel bad about it, right? Some of them are like, oh, man, I'm just, I, you know, I feel like I wasted my time in the military, blah, blah, blah. But like, I think what people are, don't earn, they're not like, understanding or keeping in mind is that like you joined the military to put yourself in a position to potentially go do that less mm -hmm. than 1% of the American population will actually do that. Um, and then to pick a job and I know like you, you wanted to do uh, Intel first, but like to pick a job, I mean, like Seaburn. So for those that are listening who don't know what Seaburn is, it's an acronym CBRN chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. Right. So when any one of those things happen, um, the Seaburn uh, technicians or, or, or whatever they're called, um, they they step in and they they have an entire mission that goes. There's recon, decon. I mean, there's a lot involved and it. it's a very specific. It's a very dangerous job. Like it's the one job in the army that I wouldn't want to have to do their job. Right. I don't want <laughs> I don't want to be in combat mm -hmm. and experience um, a chemical or a biological or a radiological or a nuclear event and have to call in these people mm -hmm. to do their jobs. Um, it's a very scary thing. So like, uh, you know, I, to me, it, 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 Seaburn, um, EOD, you know, bomb techs, right? Like those jobs, like they take big balls, honestly. Um, so to speak, you know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but yeah. uh, so, you know. Right. Um, big, big uh, fortitude. Guts. Yep. And so it's <laughs> guts. Yeah. Big guts. Big, yeah. large guts. Everywhere. So, yeah. but to but to join the military, that that's that that dragged on way too long. Um, but to join the military <laughs> in general, right, regardless of what your job is, and I think you know we we learned a very important lesson back in two thousand three when Jessica Lynch was was taken POW, that it doesn't matter what your job is. If you join the military, you are setting yourself up to potentially go overseas to do something. And while you're there, you are in, you are in danger. It's absolute fact. It doesn't matter if you're at Brassfield, Mora, or uh, Patrol Base Uvani, where Tyree and I were, or if you're at LSA Anaconda, sitting by the pool, right? Like, shit happens. Um, mm. So, uh, you know, like, for all those listening, and you know, like, if you join the military and you never did anything, you did exponentially more than you know most of your civilian counterparts yeah so uh keep that in mind it's really interesting you talk about like when you're at raytheon and you did uh you were working with the javelin mm -hmm. we fired everything under the sun while we were deployed except the javelin and the tow missiles that were on our bradleys but we used the oh. hell out of that clue the uh the thermal site uh yeah that amazing love mm -hmm. it what was that like um being a part of building that equipment and seeing it actually go to work. Um, so I was actually the, so I was a quality engineer on the floor for the Javelin missiles guidance section, um, which is like the brains of it pretty much. Um, so I, I, I mean, ever since I started the application process to go to Raytheon, honestly, um, I still have like PTSD from that. Like, you know, I'm just like, I got to do everything right. And everyone's, you know, like they put, they kind of like try to indoctrinate you, like we're watching you or like, don't, you know, say certain things or um, you have always have to be on your best behavior and being a quality engineer and then going through the training to be the quality engineer, you know, they pretty much 
tell us. I, I was the last person to sign off on units um, before they actually became government property. So if you know something were to not work, like it would you know fall back to I would be one of the people that it would fall back on. So I took my job very very seriously, and it kind of made me like as OCD as I am now, which is a good and bad thing. <laughs> but um, it I mean I was very proud of being part of that. And um, especially also um, when I took over the clue. So I did both the clue and the guidance section on the missile system. Um, and I um, I actually got a really cool opportunity to even go to the joint venture site in California um, and actually got to go through the qualification course with the simulator. Um, so I went through that course, um, you know how they have that at um, NTC. Mm -hmm. So um, I went through that simulation and kind of qualification. And it was funny that I was in the reserves too at the time, but it was for my civilian job just because I had to go through the iterations of testing the clue, basically as if I was about to fire it for every single clue that I signed off on because they came back to us to get um upgrades while they were on warranty still so um after we fixed anything so it was like they were fielded units coming back to us we would fix anything that they needed and upgrade them and then send them back so in order to send them back um, we first had to sign them off as government property um just like as the handoff and so i was the last person to sign for them um and saying, yeah, it all works. And so I went through like the iteration of like almost like pretty much firing something um, through every single clue. And I must have signed off on like, I don't know, maybe 200 plus clues. So it was it was really neat um, of an experience to go through that and like also know in the back of my head, you know, like um, it's cool that have that experience in the civilian world and then also be part of the army, even though it's not the same job, of course, but like having both, um, like kind of the best of both worlds in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I still to this day, I'm really kind of proud to say that I was part of that and I got to do that job because I, I mean, I think it was a big deal and I made a lot of, you know, improvements to the line in terms of uh, manufacturing and testing upgrades and just better things to better the line and make the product uh, what it is. But so, yeah, that's a that's a big thing to be quality control on something like that. When, <laughs> before we deployed, like we sent, I think, one or two people per platoon to uh to get javelin certified uh that was bozil in our platoon and um peeps. and peeps yeah you went yeah so we had yeah so like two javelin uh certified people and for those people for those those that are listening that don't know the javelin is insane is what it is basically it's a fire and forget right so you aim it on target um and your target can be behind a building or the building or a vehicle and you fire it and it pops out and goes straight up and then comes <laughs> down on target. Is that pretty much it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jennifer's the, she's the expert. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it goes. It's, it's kind of funny because when it first takes off, you kind of like, you're like, what's going on? You know, like, cause it, it takes off almost like it's about to just stop right there and like mm -hmm. drop, but no, it takes off like, you know, um into the air and it goes it's from above like above eye um so it's from above that it's coming down towards especially because it's anti-armor so that's what it's supposed to be used for is for tanks but um like i kind of alluded to like previously um we actually had someone come in and tell us a story that uh they thought someone was in a building that they were you know keeping an eye on at the time and they saw movement in there and that was back when they didn't have to get you know the ROE to, okay, you have identified the person, you can use it. Um, so they actually had fired a javelin um, to a, the building they were watching for a potential, you know, activity. And um, 
after they fired it, they were like, okay, let's go check it out. So they checked it out and apparently all that was moving in the building was rats in Iraq. <laughs> so they uh, used a javelin missile uh, on rats in a building that was empty and didn't have anyone in there. Well, I mean, there you go, folks. I mean, Javelin, the anti-armor um, fire-and-forget missile that can't kill rats. Now, I'll tell you what, though. <laughs> Iraqi rats, uh, there's no killing those things. They're tough, yeah. yeah. I'm sure the people of Ukraine are very happy with your work on the Javelin. Oh, um, man. That's yeah. the primary. That's one of their best, uh, the best weapons that they have going right now. So, right yeah, on. that's what I heard. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're doing a bang-up job, literally. Yeah, literally. No, and it's funny you talk about like the early days of G, uh, early days, this early days of GWAT, because um, I don't remember a single time where we had to call hire to, to return fire. Um, the rules we would get the we would get our mission brief rolling out, and ROE was, hey, when you're out, see you see bad guy um, activity, um, you you do good guy activity and you kill him. <laughs> and uh, we were mechanized infantry too, so I mean, we had you know, the Bradleys uh, before the strikers were a thing. And then um, we operated in a town that had an ODA. Um, so there's uh, special forces operating out of there. So we typically had access to the AC one thirties and uh, a couple of times we had fast movers come in F 16s. I think they were um, all kinds of good stuff. We had a lot of good things, mm -hmm. but we fired pretty much everything in town except the tow missile and the javelin. I don't think we ever fired the javelin, which is upsetting. Aww. It really is. Yeah. Because yeah. I would love to have seen that thing in action. Um cool yeah. For like I mean, for sure. Yeah, dude. Like daytime. Gone. I mean, I, and I can think of a couple of times when we were there, like a couple of fights that we were in where a javelin would have come in handy. Mm -hmm. The ODA thing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah! Oh my God! Yeah, the, the, we could have used like fifty javelins during the ODA thing. There was this uh, fight that we had, more or less, where we're staying in the middle of the town with the uh, special forces group of folks. I'm not going to lay out a bunch of stuff because my memory's terrible. Yeah. But uh, while we were there, we basically got attacked more or less by a bunch of people in the city. And I think if we would have had javelins, we wouldn't have. Uh, had that certain issue with somebody shooting the AT4 into the uh, telephone poles. <laughs> <laughs> we would have had all kind of different things going on. I think it would have stopped a lot sooner, but I mean, ultimately a fucking jet had to come in and save us, but it was uh, wow. a good day. It was a fun it, time. So. It was, it was a lot more than that. Tyree is oversimplifying the entire mission. Like, <laughs> it, it started out at night and we had AC-130 um, overwatch and they were dropping rounds. Um, and then, like I said, like you said, we had we were working with the SF. The Peshmerga were there. We had our snipers. We had their snipers. They had the old school, you know, the um, the M203, the the three twenties, the grenade launcher. They had the old Vietnam version, the thump guns. Um, <laughs> we had fifty cows, Mark nineteens, our Bradleys. Uh, eventually, we had the fast movers, the AT4. I was running ammo from one building to another uh, building when they when he fired that AT4 and hit that 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 wire. I hit the ground so hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of one of two times I think in Iraq that I actually low crawled, um, the fastest I've ever low crawled. Um, the other time was during that same operation when that when that jet came in and its gun run because I had never heard that sound before in my life and, yeah. whoo, but uh, wild times. So I, I am sad to report that we didn't get to use the javelin, even though we were there before you were working at Raytheon. Um, but super glad that that javelin exists because I have seen videos of its use and uh, it does the trick. Yes. It, <laughs> unless it's rats. Um, so now, so you said, so now you're in the IRR. So you are, uh, like you said, like one foot out the door. Mm -hmm. You're You're moving on into your primarily civilian life. You're not at Raytheon anymore, are you? No, I'm at Northrop Grumman, and I work on uh, communications satellites. So I kind of switched gears because um, at when I was at Raytheon, I went from the Javelin to air-to-air -air missiles, and then eventually that led me to going into a skiff and being in a skiff. And I worked the night shift, twelve-hour shifts. Um, yeah, <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. I had enough of working long hours in a skiff and having no life uh and eventually like it kind of started getting to me you know hearing about 
you know, I mean, not to get too into it, but like uh, them being, you know, it's it sucks kind of hearing the feedback from you guys that like you didn't get to fire a javelin. And then you hear the stories about when these missiles are fired and sometimes they're not like it, they hit something they weren't supposed to or someone that wasn't who they thought, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, like, I mean, it was really cool when they first were like, oh yeah, they're, they're sending all these javelins to Ukraine, but up thinking back, it's like, that's cool and all, but like, kind of sucks that like not a lot of our own soldiers got to use them and they're all being used in Ukraine right now. Mm -hmm. But I mean, uh, I guess it's good. It's a good, good and bad thing. Um, but yeah. yeah, I kind of had my fair share of working on missiles after a while. So I wanted to do something else that was still EOD sort of related. And um, yeah, I switched because I was actually like a level one manager, uh, a value stream lead when I left Raytheon. And I wanted to go back to engineering because I really liked the test operations engineering. And I um, applied for test operations engineering at Northrop Grumman doing satellites. So I switched gears a little bit um, and I got to work on, uh, I mean, I worked on NASA and um, stuff for the now Space Force. Um, two of the satellites that I majorly worked on being in operations are in orbit right now, um, which is kind of cool. Um, so that is yeah, fucking, and, that is really neat. Yeah. Hey, so you you probably know then. Um, was the moon landing fake? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't know that honestly. Um, <laughs> I don't think it is. I hope not. <laughs> no, it's uh, you know, you, could, you said NASA anyway. Um, yeah. that's really badass. Though. So you do some pretty cool stuff, like, like you know some things that we can't talk about. That's cool. I'm gonna ask yeah. one. Uh, Northrop Grumman. Is it in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles area ish? Or... Oh yeah, they have air. They have corporate offices all over the yeah. U.S. and around the world. Um, there, there is one in L.A. for sure. Um, you're, I'm, east, you're East Coast though, right? Yeah. So I work from home because I do design work now, um, oh. and I, I actually kind of, you know, I wanted to get away from the clearance after I had done all the clearance sort of work at Raytheon. Mm -hmm. um, and so I turned down the offer that I got to, you know, upgrade and um, do TSF and have to stay um, working at, on site. And I said, no, I just, I want to get away from, I don't want to do clearance paperwork ever again. <laughs> it's funny how I switched gears all of a sudden, because I wanted to do Intel analysts, but after doing that kind of work, it was a lot. So um, I was like, I'm just going to do NASA stuff. And I work from home 100% of the time supporting NASA projects now that aren't classified or anything like that. Um, uh, because now I also live with my husband, who is active duty um, here at uh, Fort Bragg. He's a part of third group. So um, being able to remote work allows me, allowed me to like move over from Arizona to now Fayetteville, which I dislike, but at least I'm with my husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard. I, I live uh, near the other popular Fayetteville in the country, the one in Arkansas where the University of Arkansas <laughs> is. Uh, and it's funny because people will like all the time confuse them. Like, well, they'll, they'll Google Fayetteville and they'll get results for like North Carolina and vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. But I've I've heard I've heard Fayetteville, North Carolina is. I'm I've, I've only been to Bragg once, and it was for. A, a short army thing because i'm in the reserves as well and um what was it, like the best warrior competition or something like that mm -hmm. and uh brag seems nice um but it mm, <laughs> yeah pass um yeah. <laughs> although although it's it's it the area is not bad you know that part of north carolina and you're you're pretty close to uh what a couple hours from the atlantic and and uh, so I don't know. There's a lot of history in that side of the country. But uh, mm -hmm. so, okay, geez, Army Reserve, Seaburn uh, uh, specialist and a former Raytheon, uh, super genius javelin maker, <laughs> quality controller, then North of Grumman, um, NASA stuff. You are like all over the place, but not like not all over the place, but yeah. like you're not all over the place, but like I feel like that's a lot of things to have to be a part of at 
you know, you said you're 31 years old. Like that's pretty impressive. That's pretty cool. And, yeah. and now I feel like you're, you're starting or, well, you've probably had it going for a minute now. Right. But like you are involved in a different venture, right? Like for yourself, right? So you have your mm -hmm. own business, uh, you call it peach tails. Mm -hmm. What is going on with peach tails and actually just, yeah. What is, what is that? <laughs> um, so I had, you know, my husband actually had, um, you know, when we met, he had started already would be official. I don't know if you guys have heard of, uh, would be official. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, he had that going and, you know, I got to kind of watch that and it, it was really cool. It's, they do really well. Um, and, uh, you know, just knowing that kind of like, I, I had always wanted to kind of, you know, do my own thing, like little side hustle apart from engineering. Um, and so he kind of encouraged me, like, you know, you should start your own business. Like, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, um, at the time I was, you know, I was in the whole activewear phase. So I was like, oh, why not start an activewear company? Um, so I did. And um, we were doing activewear for most of last year because um, I started it um, late 2020, but it didn't really like that, you know, setting it up and whatnot. And um, we didn't really launch until like 2021. And so 2021 um, was like our first full year, but it didn't really get big or like, it's not big, but you know, it didn't really take off for a couple of months because I was kind of getting slow into it because it's really hard doing it with like a full-time job and I was still in the reserves. So um, at the time I was in Phoenix and I was driving to um, El Paso for reserve drill so it was quite the drive you know when I had to go on those weekends and it was every month and um so it was slow but it was okay because I was like you know what I, I'm glad that I started it um and from there uh, you know it made it easier moving here and having him to help me um but yeah it's been um I, we're going through a rebranding now because I kind of I don't know I it felt right to go through it because um I was kind of over the, all the active wear I was like I don't think people need this much active wear <laughs> so we're rebranding and doing athleisure and more you know um sort of business style um clothing for women um because it fits more into the kind of lifestyle that I have anyways and uh it's um yeah I mean I that was kind of the result of you know not of telling myself stop just preparing and just do it just start and then go from there um so yeah it's it's kind of messy to talk about it and uh whatnot but it's basically just the product of me finally starting something and going with the flow which i think that's um something that people you know that are thinking about starting their own side hustle or whatever it is that they want to do is just you know, to start and then figure it out from there, because at least you're going towards what you want to do, because um, it's always going to be messy, no matter how much you prepare or put it off. And um, my husband actually kind of told me, you know, it, what's more important is when you're looking back, you know, if they, I would have waited another year, um, you know, I would probably feel a lot more prepared, but in the end, it that preparation probably could have not done anything because it's just um, you can't prepare for everything in life. You know, it just um, you just have to try your hardest and bring your best self to whatever you do. So he said, you know, even if you start and it takes a while to take off, at least you're, you know, a year into it now um, and you've taken a year towards where you want to be um and learn from that rather than prepare for an entire year and then you haven't even started so um kind of just having that in mind like you know to just start and then you know work towards your goal and it'll it'll change while you're doing it um kind of having that sort of guidance um 
helped me, you know, say, you know what, you're right. Like, why am I waiting so long to do something that I say that I want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of times the uh, us veterans, we, we sit around and think about something that we want to do. Um, we always have some kind of plan, some kind of idea that we came up in a foxhole and basic with a friend, like, man, when I get out of here, I'm going to catch shrimp or whatever. <laughs> Everyone has something. And it's very important for people to understand that all you really need to do is just really try and start mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you never know what happens until you actually try and you miss every shot that you don't take and all those mm -hmm. shit things that they come up with to make you want to do it. Just do it. Mm hmm you know be proud of uh you can be proud of something that you put together and put out there active where you say it wasn't a great thing so hey plan b you got to have mm -hmm. a plan a through z nowadays because things are different it's crazy but mm -hmm. yeah that's uh it's uh it's simper gumby right um always be flexible yeah. always mm -hmm. always flexible always rolling with punches and like you said being fluid it's funny actually tyree and i were talking about that earlier today because we we were kind of um, he and I will sit around and we'll like brainstorm and spitball and just have conversations. And, you know, like generally from those conversations, a lot of our ideas come from that. And uh, that was one of the things that we kind of talked about is just kind of trying to be fluid with it um, and understand, you know, uh, I mean, that was kind of my take on it anyway, is like the direction that we intend to go versus the direction we end up going, maybe two different things, but like, you know, if, if you're not willing to be flexible with those changes and like mm -hmm. adapt with them, then yeah, you're going to, you're going to potentially sink. Um, so I think that's one thing that he and I have done. We, 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 we often talk about like the show and like how it's doing. Like we talk about it a lot actually. And uh, probably, and you know, we talk about it a lot, but probably not enough if you, you know, if you catch my drift, but like, yeah. like be, just because like we want to stay on top of things, we want to make sure that we're, we're still growing. We're still heading in the right direction. Um, and that the, the that we still stay behind our original intent, our original purpose, and um, and 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 that is to one tell veteran stories and two help other veterans hear these stories so that maybe they can be inspired by these, um, by their stories and 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 become successful in their own way. Mm -hmm. Um, but like that is a big important thing. Like if you stay rigid in your in your in your path, right, in your goal, then. I think that tends to set you up a little bit more uh, with, with failure, right? Like it sets you up to be, to be a failure because man, like where you're headed may not be where you need to go. And the market changes. I mean, you said like you got mm -hmm. into active wear. I mean, you can like in, in women's active wear, like, I mean, was it like, there's a ton of them, Fleo and Lululemon and all these other ones. I mean, they're just taking mm -hmm. over. Um, mm -hmm. Uh. So it is a pretty saturated market. And so what did you do? You adjusted, you rebranded, you adjusted. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you know, now we're going to go into a different way. And, um, and you're going to make it your own thing. So that's really cool uh, that, that you're able to do that. And that we're able to, to talk about that. You know, <laughs> uh, that's, an, that's an important thing to keep in mind for folks. Um, I was going to, I was thinking of something just a second ago, but I completely forgot. Uh I have to ask, uh, back to your military career, uh, was there anything about the time that you served where you were like, man, this was a mistake? Like, oh, yeah. how many more years of this? You know, I'm missing yeah. the summer now because of reserve stuff. Like, man, like, what is the, any any regrets? And what would you tell someone that does have regrets? Um, I mean, <laughs> I feel like that, sort of those thoughts hit everyone at, at least at one point when they've served you know mm -hmm. um but I think I I mean I was it was funny because when I first had joined you know it, people used to joke when I would go to drill I was always smiling they're like why are you so happy you know <laughs> like because I hadn't been broken yet I guess um but um I actually had like my first sort of like bad experience um when I was, you know, trying to see what the heck I had to do in order to get a promotion, because I went in as a specialist having um, a degree already. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was doing all the right things. And, you know, I was a PT star. And, uh, you know, it didn't make any sense. I was like, I know I have to go to, um, you know, the school to get BLC, um, 
to get my stripes, but you know, what else is there to do? And, you know, I had to get a packet together and whatnot. And um, the, the unit that I was in was just awful with packets and reserving slots for those mm. schools. And what um, an army reserve yeah. unit, just awful. I'm just kidding. I can't, I can't say that. <laughs> we actually just recently recorded with my commanding general. And I will say that in the 95th division, uh, we actually do pretty decent with a lot of that stuff. Like my CG genuinely cares, but I do hear that, that theme a lot in the reserves. We're like, you know, like, man, I've been trying to get promoted. Like I, that's actually one of our recruiting points is like, Hey, you've been in the army for 10 years and you're still a specialist. You're still an E4. Uh, do you want to come over to be a drill sergeant? Because we'll send you to BLC. We'll send you to the Academy. You know, you, you can't be a drill sergeant unless you're a sergeant. So <laughs> And it works. Um, and and we we typically hold hold true to that promise. Sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. It just it was laughing. Oh, no, you're right. It was funny because like, oh wow, that's it's a common thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate that it's it's like that. Um, and I mean, it was also unfortunate that like the unit that I was in at the time was just you know they didn't have it together because the unit that I went to afterwards like actually loves promoting their soldiers, so they make it really easy on them. They they literally prepare the packet for them and the soldier doesn't really have to do anything except, you know, be okay with the school slot that they get and go and uh, come back. Um, so it was kind of a nightmare to like deal with because I just kept hearing, you know, come back next drill or come back during the week and we'll try to find a slot for you, but then we have to do your packet. And I had pretty much put together my own packet as a specialist. Um, and then was trying to get this moving um, because I just, you know, I didn't want to be a specialist my entire reserves career. So, um, yeah, I was, I ended up having to do an IG complaint in order to get this packet moving and get a slot at the school. So I was basically begging for a, a slot at BLC, which looking back, it's crazy to me, but it, it worked, you know, like, and that's the other thing that I have no problem telling people about that experience is you know if something isn't right say something that's why ig jag exist it's like you know unfortunately we all hear stories about how people are doing the wrong thing and they get caught and it blows up and you know it's you have to wonder how long have things been that way because people have let it slide and they didn't want to say anything because they were scared of rep like repercussions and whatnot but i mean just my little IG complaint as a specialist trying to go to BLC, um, it went all the way to like, you know, the Sergeant Major of the MP Reserves, um, you know, division. So it was a huge deal. And that he actually emailed me personally and like apologized that I had to go through all of that. And they reserved the slot right away. And I went and um, finally left. And I took that experience with me um, to, being an NCO and I pushed my soldiers uh, to want to get promoted and to take advantage of everything. And I was actually fortunate enough before I had to transfer um, from that unit to the unit that I was last at here in North Carolina, um, I was able to be my own specialist that kind of had trouble with the same thing because of COVID happening. Mm. Um, that kind of messing up with like the schools and whatnot um, and the boards too. Um, I, I was able to see him get promoted um, and helped him, you know, push his packet and get to go to BLC. He actually got to go to Puerto Rico, which was like really cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was cool being able to be a part of, you know, just my three soldiers taking care of them, trying to be a good leader and pushing them to want to do more and do their best and seeing him, uh, get his stripes um, because he was just as motivated as I was when I initially was trying um, the entire process. Um, so it's it's cool to kind of like, I mean, it, it sucks that I went through that at the same time, but I didn't let that stop me from, you know, getting what it was that I wanted. And I wanted to use that experience to help others as well. Um, so that's why, I mean, any chance I get that someone kind of brings up something similar or whatnot or something that it seems like IG would probably help them in their situation. I definitely bring it up like it works. Um, and it, you know, you should do it because it's your career and no one's gonna save you except yourself. 
Yeah. Um, so. I hundred percent agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and so, and I can, mm-hmm. I can, I can see, I can see people listening and watching and being like, man, I don't know if I would have taken it that far, but here's the thing. And it's like you said, <laughs> IG and JAG exist for a reason in the reserves and guard and the active duty military, you have the option to get a hold of your Congressman for a reason. It's because mm-hmm. we have this ability, even though you're a lower ranking person, if you see something that you know is just not right, we have the ability to hold people accountable. Right. Um, because as a specialist, you know, it's very difficult for you to, to, Hey, Hey, first sergeant, Hey, sergeant major, Hey, uh, captain, Hey, major, Hey, lieutenant colonel, this isn't right. You know, you can use these open door policies all you want, but if, if that doesn't work, then what you're not, you're not left with, you know, serving under injustice. Right. Um, so yeah, those things exist for a reason Those they exist, um, to maintain accountability in the force what they're there for. Um, and like you said, like, it's your career, it's your progression, it's your life. And no one is no, no one has your best interests more in mind than yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. One of the, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was I was a, uh, probably 17, 16, 17 years old. And, uh, my stepmom, um, I was crying over a girl, you know, like as, <laughs> as a 16 year old boy does. And, uh, and she's like, you have to watch out for yourself. Right. Because like, no one is going to take care of you more than you, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's like your friends, your family, they may love you, right? But um, they can't 100% always be there for you. Just like in the military, like right? your NCOs, your, 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 your chain of command, they'll be there for you when they can, but like there's, they can't, you can't expect a person to drop everything in their life to be there for you 100% of the time. And I can't remember what brand it is and what person, um, it is that said it, but it, you know, it goes, it's, it's to the, to the effect of like, uh, no one's coming. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Save yourself. No one's coming. Right. Like it's kind of the mm-hmm. same thing, right? Like you have to carry your own weight. So mm-hmm. it all kind of falls under that. So, uh, and with that being said, being an NCO and, you know, getting to that point and then helping others get to that point too. Like that's what being an NCO is. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Being a non-commissioned officer, being a sergeant of any kind is literally that, like tr- getting your troops ready for the next level. I mm-hmm. am an E5 and I have this E4. I want this E4 to take my position. So I'm going to prepare them for that in whatever way possible. Mm-hmm. So that's really great that you had that mindset um, and that you, you, uh, you're putting that out there because that, that needs to be said, that needs to be done. Um, so that's really cool. On the um on the business side of things, I have to ask you, right? Army, Raytheon, North of Grumman, Peach Tales, the rebranding of Peach Tales. What of all of that in your mind was the most challenging? Um uh, honestly, Peach Tales is the most challenging. And yeah. I know it sounds like, you know it sounds like what that doesn't make any sense because um you would think my job as an engineer is extremely difficult and it's so funny because every time I tell people they're like I kind of dread the question actually when they're like what do you do for work I'm like oh here we go like uh, I'm a electrical engineer um from Northrop Grumman and they're like oh what are they because a lot of people don't know what Northrop Grumman is um and you know I'm like oh like they're defense contractor they work on you know like I work on communication satellites that are in space. And then as soon as I say like satellite space, they're like, whoa, that sounds so difficult. What? Um, And, you know, it's funny because it's like, well, I don't, you know, I'm not making the entire satellite by myself or I'm I'm not the only electrical engineer on the satellite. I actually do only like the power subsystem circuit card design, which is a very specific job. And it's kind of doing the exact same thing, like, you know, over and over again. Um, but it takes a very long process to, you know, go from design, um, which is what I do now. But before I was testing, so I was at the end of the line where these things were designed, built, and, you know, going through a million tests before they're certified, ready to go into space to do its mission. So um, it's kind of kind of cool to like have gone through almost the entire manufacturing line 
and now be at the very start of it and see like the big, you know, the big picture sort of thing. Um, but yeah, like uh, that job, you know, it's it sounds like it's difficult and like you have to be this genius person to have that sort of a position and it's really not like you'd be surprised I mean my job's kind of boring because I've been doing it for a while now right so um yeah like those types of jobs like um I know they sound big and scary and like a lot of people were like oh that would be a dream to do honestly like if you are interested in it you should definitely go for it especially don't let like a title or engineering seem like it's too difficult to do and once you do one thing that's like too difficult um, and you figure out, oh, like now I'm here and it actually wasn't that bad. I learned a lot you know, like that takes you, um, that makes you want to go further, you know, and explore other things such as being an entrepreneur and starting a business. So, um, yeah, I mean, starting a business, I think it's the most difficult because there's not one Thing. like there's no major in school like, you can do business all day but it's not going to prepare you for owning your own business where you're doing every single job when you first start um because you know going in the corporate world you're filling a role that's part of a big you know company such as like it's the same thing when you join the army you know like you're filling a role that's part of a big a big thing but when you start a business it might seem like a small thing right but you're actually filling like multiple roles at once and learning the entire process of having a business, even if it's like, you know, selling stuff on Etsy, you're still sort of doing almost every single vital thing that a big company does yourself. Um, so then the only reason I think that it's hard is because um, I would have never thought that like the stuff that I think is difficult um, is would would have been stuff that I actually am having to do if that makes sense um like because like I said um you never know until you just try so it's the it's definitely only difficult because um you can't plan for everything that happens um you can't expect everything that actually happens so it's um you know like it's kind of interesting to put that into perspective, I guess, is like, a, you know, I out of everything else that I've done, that's kind of like, it has that has a whole plan that I had to go through. It's kind of like a schedule thing, you know, I had in order to get the job that I have with Northrop Grumman, I had to go get an engineering degree, right. And that's a step by step four year plan, and whatnot. But owning a business, it's like, you don't know how long you're going to be owning the business and you don't know if the initial idea you had owning the business is going to be what it is in five years, you know, it can grow into a huge thing. And then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I would have never thought, you know, starting this small business, I would have this huge company that like now I'm able to like to quit my job full time and go completely into this business and um, doing something that you're actually really interested in. It's part of like your living. So. Um, yeah. That's it's definitely the most difficult because of just that. Like I can't plan for what's to come, but it's kind of exciting at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I was uh, I asked you that question fully hoping that that was going to be your answer. Um, <laughs> because I mean, it's it's like you said, like you apply for a job, and so you go to college. It's all laid out for you. It's a four year four year plan, mm -hmm. or you know, in my case, a thirty year plan. Um, <laughs> um, so you, you, you apply for a job, you apply for security clearance, you go to college, you do all these steps and it's all laid mm -hmm. out for you. And it's just like finite, like, you know, like this is what I have to do. And then here's the end point, creating a business, especially in um, apparel. Um, I had attempted that once very, and I say attempted, I use that very loosely. Um, actually, this shirt is, is, is one that I had made um, with, from a brand that I was going to try and make. And I just didn't follow through with it because uh, I wouldn't have a lot of confident confidence in my ideas. Um, I, you know, this is like the only shirt that I have and well, I have like four others, I guess, but they're not like, this one. <laughs> anyway, it's a whole thing, but I never, I didn't follow through with it. And a big part of it is, is like, and I was using drop shipper, drop shippers. Cause this is like, it's just graphic t-shirts, right? Those are easy to do. Um, mm -hmm. But the problem is it's like, like the active wear uh, thing. It's just a, it's a very saturated community ton of like, 
businesses out there trying to do the same thing, especially, you know, and there's a lot of haters in the veteran community who are like, oh, so you could be a veteran and make another t-shirt company. Good for him. Yeah. You know what (laughs) I mean? And uh, if you're one of those people who think that or say that you suck, you're a terrible person and you're (laughs) not supporting your brothers and sisters in arms anyway. um, But it was like, like, like Tyree and I talked about earlier today, like um, I think everybody has this, like this creative side to them and they want to be able to, uh, to express it. Right. Mm -hmm. But like when it comes to apparel, especially like what you were doing, because you're not just like printing words on a shirt, right? You're, you're going into textiles. Like you're trying to find uh, people that create the material that you're looking for and they stitch it a certain way and it's produced a certain way. So now you have to come up with the dimensions and the sizes and the material and the cost. And, you know, like you're going through like, you know, what's the startup capital for this? Like, what's the, the the profit and loss and all of that stuff? I mean, like all of these things, and you're having to do that, like you said, all on your own, because mm-hmm. a big company, like, let's say, what's a big brand that's out there? Nike, for example, Nike has an entire fucking complex of people who work mm-hmm. on producing this one product that is Nike. It's just you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and fortunately, you have the assistance of your husband who's 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 been through uh the 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 startup of all this stuff before so you had some guidance there but like and that's great but it's still a super challenging thing and mm-hmm. um so I was really I asked that question hoping that that would be your answer because and it's it's scary right mm-hmm. I mean you have a you have a great job sounds like it probably pays you at least minimum wage or more um it was a <laughs> at least minimum wage yeah oh yeah <laughs> somebody laugh please i feel like an asshole for saying that since nobody laughed but um no, i i feel like it you know but that's the thing is like um it's it's still a scary concept because now you're putting you're putting your expressions out in the world you're saying this is something that i'm designed that i've designed i'm proud of it and i want other people to like it and you know how it is like if you mm-hmm. don't like my idea that sucks man no, maybe maybe my <laughs> ideas do suck and then on top of all of that, what if your business fails, mm-hmm. you know, and even if you do have the backing of a great career, it doesn't mean that like, it's not a scary feeling to think that like your business mm-hmm. could crash. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. Uh, now let me ask you this. Um, with all of that being said, would you do it over again? One, two part question. Would you do it all over again? Let's say your business done today would you restart another apparel business and two what advice would you give to somebody else especially somebody from the military community uh with our you know type of skill set that we have in the military what type what what advice would you give them in in doing this can you hear me still yeah okay sorry it like the bluetooth went on and off for some reason um so i caught the kind of the first part of the question and then the second part like um like the last little bit like the advice that i would give someone yeah especially somebody from like the military community um Mm -hmm. you know because we you know we learn how to work a certain way and have a certain uh thought process and all of that stuff so like yeah like if if peach tails crash and burn today tomorrow would you pick up would you be like the phoenix and rise from the ashes and become a new business and Mm -hmm. um and if so, and considering what you've done in the past, what advice would you give to somebody who's wanting to start? Um, no, it's funny you asked that because I guess in a way, um, the rebranding is sort of like um, picking up from what I thought could have been the end of Peach Tales um, because unfortunately, um, it, yeah, it's kind of funny how everything happens, um, you know, as it does, because unfortunately, um, I got backlash from veterans um, that I thought were friends of mine um, while I was starting this business. And I'm still having to go through that. Um, I'm taking legal matters um, now to protect my business, um, which has been months of things that I could not use on top of everything that I have, everything else that I have to do, right? Um, but it's kind of funny looking back at like everything else that I've done. It's like, well, I'm in this position 
am taking matters into my own hands like I did back when I was a specialist trying to get promoted. You know, I, I uh, used IG for help. And um, I think the situation is also necessary, even though it is has been so painful and expensive, very expensive um, up front um, to prepare to go through. Um, I would I would say, you know, I guess think of a, uh, I'm kind of like in the situation still, obviously. Um, and so it's, I mean, you're gonna have good and bad days, but you know, I was out to stop the business whenever I thought, you know, it's like I'm, I've had enough of people and their backlash and yeah, it's a saturated market and I have it's tough with the full-time job and everything, but like looking back, like at the person that I've come to be um, with my past experiences, I hadn't quit anything else that I had done, even though there was a lot of, you know, um, kind of bumps in the road along the way. Um, you know, I would say, even if it takes you longer to, you know, do what it is you want to do, like, don't let that stop you from keep trying to keep going. And, you know, look at all the super successful people that there are in the world, like Elon Musk, for example, like the guy's the richest guy in the world and people talk bad about him, but he could, you know, care less. He uses it as like a joke, you know, um, like just think about people like that. Like he wouldn't have gotten to where he's at if he would have actually like stopped and cared about what people said about him. Um, so like the more successful you get, you have to kind of start getting used to, unfortunately, getting backlash and getting people that are like, you know, trying to bring you back down to their level, like, oh, you can't do that, you know, like, oh, but there's so many other companies that are doing that, you know, why would you want to do that? It's like, because it's a different option for people and people are free to make the choice to buy from whoever they want. So why not give people another option? Um, that's kind of how I, you know, came to think of it because I thought the same thing in my head, like, why would I want to start activewear when there's so many th companies already out there? Um, but then, you know, I kind of take a step back as a consumer and I'm like, do I buy just from one company? No, I buy from several companies. If it's something that I like, I buy it, you know? And so I would say don't, I ever focus on just because there's 50 other companies doing the same thing, um, you know, like don't think that you can bring your own creative um, aspect into it and not succeed as well because people are free to make the choice to buy from anyone they want and um, it could turn out really great, you know, and um, so I mean, I would say don't let anyone that's ultimately unhappy themselves and too scared to try themselves um, stop you from one, starting and trying. Um, and two, like along the way, you're going to get those types of people. But the more you keep going, like they'll just go away by themselves and like, you know, get used to it because success doesn't come easy, um, you know, and that's what makes successful people so, I think, you know, encouraging to like look up to because you have to like, there, there's probably no one person that's successful that's had it easy their entire life. They've had to go through multiple issues and, you know, whatnot in order to get to where they're at. And, you know, the thing that they do best is protect themselves and their companies. Um, so um, always don't, don't, don't ever allow anyone to make you feel little is I guess what I want to say in the bigger picture is it doesn't matter um, where you're like with what you have to start or what your idea is like it could turn out like to be something bigger than you ever thought, um, which is kind of like what this rebrand has turned into, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to have realized, you know, active or really wasn't like the thing for me, but it's okay because I started there and then it's kind of built into what it is becoming. And I'm really part, I'm really proud to be able to even just, you know, be upfront about that. Um, you know, it's like, 
yeah, we're rebranding because I realized that like the active world wasn't just everything that I wanted to do. I wanted to do, you know, whatever it is that I want. So I'm kind of like rebranding the brand to do that. And um, people have enjoyed it and really like where we're going with it. So um, yeah, I mean, I guess don't let anyone stop you or make you feel little and just keep going really is all it is. Right on. That's yeah, that. Uh, go ahead, Kevin. No, yeah, no. Well, I, I was just going to say, it rem- honestly, that reminds me of like the Thomas Edison quote of like, uh, you know, when he asked, like, you know, like, why did it take you so long to invent the light bulbs? Like, I didn't find, <laughs> what was it like 10,000 uh, uh, 10, yeah. 10, ways to not make a light bulb? And all I needed to find is just one. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and, and he also said something about like, ten, it's like 1% inspiration. Success is like 1% insp- uh, inspiration and 99% perspiration. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and I it think sounds the best, the best quote i've ever heard about any of this kind of success stuff is especially when it comes down to friends and all this kind of stuff is they ask you why haven't you blown up yet why haven't you grown to the point that you wanted to grow and my response will always be why didn't you share my shit yeah yeah why didn't you push the stuff out there to give it to more people yep. let them learn about what i'm doing mm-hmm us in the military and us as humans for whatever reason man we're all about cutting each other down like your good mm-hmm. ideas there's always somebody there to be like no you should yeah. do that uh you need to come up with something better or i wouldn't do that if i were you i would do something mm-hmm. else but what are you doing you're not doing anything i'm just sitting here mm-hmm. trailblazing like either get on the bus or get out of the way because it's gonna run you over mm-hmm. that's how it's got to be yep how it is uh in 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 america to to get by you just have to do it you can't mm-hmm. you can't listen to the bullshit from other people who have no plans and you can't listen to yourself because you'll doubt yourself out of the picture sometimes you yep. just do it man no, and on, it, no it, go ahead kevin well i was gonna say and and, and and jennifer you brought up the perfect example elon uh because <laughs> that dude like there's a lot of people that talk shit about elon musk and <laughs> the dude turns it all into a joke and it's just, he just, he just, he just rolls with it and he just continues to be Elon Musk. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, I think that's probably like the biggest takeaway, right? Is just like, fuck it, man. Like you do you and haters are going to exist regardless. Um, And, uh, and and keep on pushing. Um, So I'm, 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 I I follow both of your accounts on Instagram. Um, Let's see here. I had him. I just had him pulled up. So you've got uh, your your personal, right? Jennifer on on Instagram, right? A U N is your last name, and then mm-hmm. Peach Tales. Um, we're we're sharing this so people can follow you. Peach Tales, Peach Tales one word dot apparel. So Peach Tales dot apparel on Instagram. Uh, you can find both of those accounts. And uh, are you wearing? Are you wearing your own stuff right now? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'm wearing my own stuff. Tyree, what are you wearing? Something found uh, in the closet that I bought yeah. years ago. Uh, you guys that aren't watching the video, you you won't be able to see all the cool uh, advertising we're doing right now. So you're missing out, honestly. <laughs> like, video. if you are listening, stop it. I mean, c- continue to listen to the end, and then go to YouTube and then rewatch it because you're gonna want to see our faces and and all the cool things. And Jennifer's wearing her Peach Tales apparel right now, and you can't even tell what it is, and it looks good. You know what I mean? Looks better than my shirt. Um, I mean, I don't know anything about women's fashion, but uh, I think if I was a woman, I'd wear it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Jennifer, uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna make like a tree and uh, get the fuck out of here. Um, you got anything you want to leave us with? Words of wisdom. Um, yeah, I mean, just I guess what I've been reiterating, which you know we didn't have planned. Uh, so I guess what I've been trying to, I guess, say is, you know, if you keep going, you could go, go really far, um, you know, and once you break down one barrier that you thought, you know, goal you, you, you couldn't accomplish, um, you're going to want to do more, you get hungrier for more. So, you know, start from somewhere and go with the one goal you have and accomplish that. And then you'd be surprised when you look back in five, 10 years, you're like, wow, like I really came a long way just because I kept going. And it's not that hard to just keep going, you know, when you say it 
that way, right? But when you're going through all this stuff, you learn so much about, you know, boundaries and, you know, you, you appreciate where you're at a lot more the more you had to endure. Um, so, yeah, don't let anyone stop you from wanting to start a t-shirt company just because there's a million other t-shirt companies out there. You know, the people that talk crap about that kind of stuff are just jealous because they're too scared to try themselves. Um, so, you know, you just got to find the right people that have a similar mindset and stick with them and together you can grow, um, you know, how a community should be, which isn't like tearing anyone down just because they want to do their own thing. Like, that means that you're in the wrong crowd. So you just need to find the right people. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'm definitely someone that loves helping, especially other women veterans. And, um, you know, I didn't let my unfortunate experience with um, the veteran community um, stop me from, you know, the small business that I've been trying to build. Um, and I think it's, you know, kind of turning around for me because I told myself uh, last year going through all the issues that I was going through and kind of still am, you know, I want to separate myself from the veteran community. I don't even want to identify as a veteran anymore. Like I took down all the veteran affiliated stuff with the business. I wanted to get away because I thought the community was so toxic. Um, and it's nice kind of like, you know, having you reach out to me and ask me if I wanted to be on your podcast because it's like a good reminder that like just because you've had one or two bad experiences with um, people that share one thing in common with you, which is like being a veteran, doesn't mean that everyone in the community is that way. Um, and if we all, all the good ones band together, then we can definitely, you know, outdo the bad apples and, uh, you know, what we take away from that. And as long as we keep going and pushing each other, like we can really go far and really change, hopefully, um, you know, the way people look at the community as a whole um, together, which, you know, is how it, anything really should be, you know, you should always see something, say something, right? Yeah, right. Amen. So, hey, thanks everyone for listening to Before I Forget. Please like, listen, share, subscribe, and watch. Thank you, Jennifer, for coming on to our awesome podcast. Kevin, do you have anything to say? Uh, yeah, no, Jennifer, again, thank you so much uh, for coming on and talking about all the things that you do. And uh, and seriously, like some really good advice in there. Um, I'm looking forward to the show airing and, and getting the feedback on it because uh, I guarantee you there's a lot of people out there, a lot of veterans who need to hear those exact words, uh, Tyree and I uh, included. So appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you so for having me on. Yeah, thank you. And uh, again, thank you for listening. Please like, listen, share, subscribe, watch. Say bye, Kevin. Bye, Kevin, and go to our fucking YouTube, people. Thank you. <laughs> bye, Jennifer. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Um righty. Done. <laughs>